All right, and welcome to your lumbar puncture training video, part of your pediatric simulation training series. I'd like to remind you to make sure that you take the quiz following this exam as part of a Google form. You must put in your name and submit it prior to coming for your scheduled training session. All right, so we're going to cover uh, some main objectives, basically to make sure you know the indications and contraindications for an LP review the proper positioning and best practices, and then review some complications that can occur. First, we'd like to go over the indications that you need to know. Please review this slide briefly. And just to read them off, it's meningitis, meningoencephalitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, malignancy for its diagnosis and sometimes treatment, pseudotumor cerebri, some normal pressure hydrocephalus, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and vasculitis. This is not an all-inclusive list, so please feel free to review more on your own. There are some significant contraindications that I need you to make sure you know. If you have a patient who's apneic and bradycardic, that might not be the best patient to gun-ho go in and do an LP on right away. Proper workup and making sure that the patient is safe first is what you need to do. Next, you need to make sure that if there's a localized skin or soft tissue infection that you're not doing a lumbar puncture at that site. If there's any evidence of bleeding, you need to make sure that you're not going to cause bleeding into the spinous process space. Therefore, if you need platelets or other clotting factors, replace those prior to starting the LP. If there's increased intracranial pressure or anything on your exam suggesting it, you should put off doing the lumbar puncture until you are sure that you will not cause a herniation. Any LP done below where you've done a spinal block can result in significant hypotension or loss of CSF. Finally, a Chiara malformation or other malformations of the spinal column can also result in bad outcomes. Next. Let's go over the equipment that you have. On the left, you can see our typical neonatal LP tray. You want to make sure that you use some type of anesthetic. If you're not using the sub -Q or intramuscular lidocaine, you should make sure that you're using some type of topical, such as Emla cream. You need to make, make sure that you're using povidoniodine. This is also called betadine. And you can see the applicators in the kit there. You need to always don sterile gloves and a mask, always use sterile drapes, make sure you have gauze, and potentially some band-aids or other bandages on hand. A manometer is always important to have. While in neonatal procedures, we don't always need to get the opening and closing pressure. But for other children, it remains a vital part of the procedure. Make sure you have enough collection tubes. Each kit typically comes with four. And if you need more collection tubes, make sure that you're using sterile, empty, with no preservatives in the tube. Finally, you need to have your spinal needle. In regards to your spinal needle, typically at Kings County and Downstate, we use the top one, the quinky needle, also known as a cutting needle. We usually use a typical 22 gauge needle Something larger can result in the risk of an increased headache or CSF leak following the procedure. Under that, you can see the recommendations in length for certain age groups. Again, these are only recommendations. In larger students, uh, patients, or if there's increased subcutaneous tissue, make sure that you are using a longer needle. Positioning is one of the most important aspects of this procedure. And I cannot stress that enough. Prior to your procedure, in donning your sterile gloves, make sure that you check for landmarks. You need to review for landmarks above the iliac crest while positioning the patient appropriately. Remember that the spinal cord ends about L1 to L2. So you're aiming for the L3, L4, L4, L5 interspace. 
beware that going too low will result in failure of the procedure as well. Please take notice of this video for proper positioning. Achieving and maintaining proper patient position with alignment of the spine is the most crucial and challenging aspect of performing lumbar punctures in children, and the importance of a good holder to maintain that position is legendary. If the patient's spine is not aligned properly, you will be more likely to stray from the midline with the spinal needle and thus not obtain the appropriate CSF sample. You'll either hit bone or the epidural venous plexus, which will result in a traumatic tap. The patient is placed on their side with their back facing the physician for the lateral decubitus position. Typically, the patient's head is placed on the side of the physician's non-dominant hand to allow a more natural angle of entry for the spinal needle in the physician's dominant hand. However, you may choose to place the patient's head on the side of the physician's dominant hand if that is your preferred way of doing the procedure. The holder stands in front of the patient on the opposite side of the examining table from the physician, holding the patient's neck and upper back flexed with one arm, and with the other arm holds the knees drawn upward to the patient's chest. Be sure that the holder has positioned the patient so that a line drawn through the patient's posterior superior iliac crests and a line drawn across the shoulders is perpendicular to the surface of the bed. Also, the plane of the patient's back should be perpendicular to the surface of the bed. Often the side of the patient that is up is tilted towards the holder. Be sure to correct this before starting. It is extremely crucial to correct these before beginning the procedure. These steps are very important to eliminating tilting, rotation, and twisting of the spine and to ensure that the needle is inserted perpendicular to the spine. For the sitting position, restrain the patient in a seated position with maximal spinal flexion, with the neck flexed forward and head facing down. In infants, an assistant can hold the infant in a sitting position with an arm and a leg of the infant in each of the holder's hands, while holding the infant's head in a flexed position with their thumbs. So again, that video you'll have a link to later to review in more depth. Position and holding, again, are most important. Make sure the spine is maximally flexed without causing compromise to the infant. Make sure the alignment of the feet, knees, and hips are straight, and position the head where you feel comfortable. Always don your gloves and set up your tray prior to coming back to the patient. Additionally, a mask should be worn. Cleanse the skin with betadine. This will prevent infection. It must be given enough time to dry or it will not work. Next, let's review how you insert your needle. On the left of this screen is an example of what you should not do. You typically hear the bevel should be up, but let's make sure that we are always pointing our bevel to the flank of the patient. Otherwise, you will make the mistake, as seen on the left, of cutting through nerves. On the right hand side, you see if the bevel is pointing towards the flank of the patient, you go in through the nerves rather than cutting them. While doing that, you want to make sure that you aim for the umbilicus with maximum flexion to ensure that you will be going through the canal. It is important to hold the needle firmly with one continuous motion. As you go through the canal, you will feel a pop and sudden decrease in resistance. This should be a good indicator that you have entered the dural space. At that point, remove this dilette and check for CSF flow. It should be clear. If you do not have CSF flow, there's a few things that you may want to do, which we will review. 
Again, it is important to place your hand firmly on the needle. I recommend your thumb behind, as seen here, with one firm, continuous motion. This will ensure that you feel the pop. If you stop every millimeter and check, you will not feel this pop, and you will not enter the dural space appropriately. It is also helpful to remember that the entrance to the dural space is likely deeper than you think it should be. Now if you get there, or you think you're there, and there is no CSF flowing, first you could consider rotating the needle about 90 degrees, as the needle may be up against part of the dura and there is no flow of fluid. However, if you decide that this did not work, rotate the needle back, insert your stylet, and consider advancing slowly, then frequently checking for CSF flow. Jugular venous compression can also help increase CSF pressure, therefore flow. If you felt bony resistance soon on insertion of your needle past the skin, you're probably not in the space. If bony resistance is felt deep, you may be out of the space have or have taken a wrong angle or potentially through the dural space and hitting the vertebra. With all of these, you will want to bring the needle back while the stylet is still in, then take a more cephalet approach to end increase patient flexion and reinsert. If bloody fluid is noted or there are clots in the tube, please reinsert the stylet and withdraw fully, then a reattempt at a different interspace. Manometry is a very important aspect that you need to consider on your patients. It is free information and can give you an idea of their clinical picture. When you start to see CSF flow, please attach the three-way stopcock to your needle. As seen on the neonatal tray earlier in this slide set, there was some flexible tubing, which may make it far easier if you attach that to your needle and then to your three-way stopcock. Note the positioning of the three-way stopcock to enable flow to go up your manometer. It can only be accurately used in the lateral DQ position and a relaxed patient. There are two parts sometimes to your manometer. Make sure that you attach those prior to starting a procedure. It is time to read the pressure when it's at its highest level, and there is some respiratory variation noted. This does not always occur in pediatric patients. You want to make sure you get enough fluid. I recommend a minimum of 1 ml per vial. You may need more than that. You will want to get a culture and grand stain, glucose and protein, and a cell count with differential every time you do an LP. A cell count and differential may be prudent to do on both the first and last tube if you notice the fluid is pinkish in color. That way you will see a clearing of your RVCs quantitatively. Finally, if you need more CSF for other tests, make sure you know how much you need prior to sticking the needle in the spine. When you're concluding your pr procedure, check closing pressure if desired, especially if you're looking for pseudotumor or rather relieving pressure from super pseudotumor. Once done, reinsert your stylet. I'll repeat that. Reinsert that stylet and then remove the needle in one smooth motion. Cleanse the back and then cover the puncture site. Which is the most common complication of lumbar puncture? Yes, you know this one, it's headache. So again, headache is the most common, however extremely uncommon and less than 10 years old. So reconsider why they have a headache if noted. Apnea, back pain, brainstem herniation, although rare. Bleeding or fluid leak around the spinal cord, an infection, pain, or hematoma, a subarachnoid epidermal cyst. You may have ocular muscle palsy, which could be transient, and also nerve trauma caused by inappropriate use of your needle. I'd like to bring your attention to the epidermoid spinal cord tumor, also called the epidermoid cyst. It's usually from either multiple attempts or not using your stylet. It takes many years to occur. However, from the translocation of the cells into the dermal space, you have caused it. 
it will result in the need for neurosurgery in that patient. Typically, this occurs in very young children, or rather, the LP occurred in very young children, and the result of it may happen many years later. In summary, make sure you know the indications and contraindications for the lumbar puncture. Make sure your tray is prepared prior to going into the procedure, and make sure before you became sterile, you found all your landmarks on your patient. Know the appropriate side of needle for the age you're using. Make sure you stay sterile, don't cause an infection. Make sure the iodine dries. Positioning, 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 positioning. And then also make sure you palpate those landmarks. Keep the bevel, bevel towards the patient's side or their flanks. Point the needle towards the umbilicus. Make sure you're staying at 90 degrees to the bed. Know how to use that three-way stopcock appropriately. Don't lose CSF. Headache is the most common complication, and as always, practice makes perfect. And you can continue to practice in our simulation center. Now that you've completed the video, please click on the link up top to complete the quiz. And remember to please input your name or you will not receive credit for taking the quiz. On the left, you'll see the video for neonatal intubation. And on the right, you'll have the link for the extended video seen earlier in this training session. Thank you guys very much. Please remember to subscribe and like this video and click on that alarm if you want to stay up to date on the best training videos out there. Have a great day.